Mike Wecky and we all just Law Society practice information session. I'm joined today by Rory O'Donnell, who's a member of the Conveyancy Committee. Um, and today we're going to be discussing remote witnessing of deeds and legal documents. Over to you, Rory. You're very welcome here today. Thank you very much for joining us. OK, thank you. Uh, now, I'll just start with a few basics, uh, which is that uh, the normal way that a person binds themselves to a legal document is to sign it. Uh, and uh, of course, you can always get somebody else to sign by appointing them on foot of a power of attorney. But uh, you don't need to have a appoint somebody under a power of attorney because, for example, the statute of frauds going back, and now the two thousand and nine Act recognised that uh, somebody may be bound on an authority given to another person without necessarily it being an, an a formal attorney. Same thing in DC's Act, uh, a lease uh, could be bind either by signed by the landlord or agent duly authorised. <clears throat> so uh, if you add to that the fact that solicitors, uh, I have on many occasions signed contracts on behalf of clients uh, without any written authority. Obviously, there were clients I knew fairly well, but it is and it was fairly widespread. Um, I would be out of general practice for some time now, but uh, I keep in touch and I I understand that practice still exists. Now, <clears throat> it's general practice for signature to important documents to be witnessed. And I suppose the, the thing that I would mention about that is that apart from we all understand if you witness something that you see it actually happening. The question of course arises in this session is about is uh, how did you see it happening? Now, uh, one of the things that uh, people perhaps have forgotten is that you can acknowledge a signature as well as <clears throat> actually uh, be seen signing a document. So. The Succession Act provides that a will uh, can be acknowledged that so that the testator may already have signed the will and it's perfectly proper to acknowledge it. Now, the rules about the witnesses being present uh, still apply. So uh, the acknowledgement has to take place in the presence of the witnesses. Uh, and the same applies to the 2009 Act. Uh, Section 64.2 of that Act provides similar provisions. So, uh, <clears throat> and both of them actually also provide that you can appoint somebody to sign in your behalf uh, so that if somebody breaks both their arms and is, needs to execute a deed, they can bring somebody to the, uh, uh, and instruct them to sign on their behalf. Now, doesn't doesn't happen very often, I would say, and I don't think I've ever come across it. Um, <laughs> and um, now, Talta Aaron or the PRAI, depending on what you want to call them, uh, they have the, the rules. And of course, naturally, they follow the 2009 Act uh, strictly. So if we just take the main documents that solicitors deal with, uh, Contracts or sale being the first one that I would think of. And <clears throat> mostly contracts for sale are signed by the purchaser and vendor in the presence of their own solicitor. Um, and if there, somebody's abroad, is there any reason why you can't witness the signature actually uh, over, a, let's say, FaceTime? Uh, or any other means, and the answer is no. I see no problem whatsoever in that. And uh, <clears throat> uh, there, I don't have an answer for that. Sorry, so my bloody phone is responding as if I had asked it something. Is that Alexa? <laughs> it's a, an Apple Watch. Uh, sorry, watch is responding to something <laughs> that wasn't addressed to it. So sorry, I put it away. Um. Uh, deeds, uh, let's say, the, but let's take any type of ordinary deed, conveyance, assignment, transfer, 
and charges. They uh, can be acknowledged um, and uh, in the ordinary way, uh, the, the rules that create a problem from a point of view for remote witnessing uh, are uh, rules, let's take our certificate of title scheme, which specifies that uh, it must be done in the presence of. And uh, the uh, 2009 Act also says in the presence of. So, <clears throat> well, if somebody might have signed, uh, already signed a document, uh, a, an acknowledgement which is perfectly satisfactory and acceptable has to be in the presence of as well. So companies, well, 2009 Act deals with companies, both uh, Irish companies and uh, uh, foreign companies. And uh, they, it doesn't say anything about their having to be witnessed. Uh, now the PRAI may have uh, the their rules in relation to it, and just <clears throat> mention in passing the sort of basic that the people who countersign this the ex the application of the seal are not witnesses; they are part of the execution of the document. Now, uh, in relation to documents, uh, the main other documents that. Uh, cause problems are uh, deeds where, uh, let's say, become an issue of some controversy. And I mean, the, let's say, start by voluntary deeds. And there's been a lot of case law in relation to that. The most significant one is getting on a bit now. It's Carol v. Carol and uh, in that case, uh, uh, and in other cases, it is held that a solicitor needs to get ad understand the facts, give advice, and to uh, not just slavishly do what the client asks them to do. And that is particularly important in relation to a uh, let's say, anything where the family home is put at risk. So guarantees, I just don't need to remind you of the aftermath of the 2008 financial crash, where the uh, sort of ducking and diving that took place and the lies that were told uh, over whether they had actually actually signed it at all or been advised in relation to it and so on so on uh, you know they reached olympic standards uh, in terms of the 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 diving and ducking uh, to avoid the responsibilities and therefore for that reason anything that people are likely to want to uh, get out of if and when a lender or other institution demands them that they actually repay and they start looking to see what they can do, their responsibilities. And the solicitors, uh, let's say they don't see, uh, denying that the solicitor advised them as being anything wrong. Uh, and and the, some of the behavior was, to be honest, was just shameless. Um, and that's by clients. Now I'm not talking about uh, solicitors, but what I say and what I think is the correct advice: if you're involving in any document, <clears throat> any transaction that involves putting the family, uh, you just literally have to be careful and extra careful, and that means, I, in my opinion. You have to see the person uh, doing it remotely, I do not think is acceptable. <clears throat> and you need to advise. And by that, I mean the advice needs to be in writing. A file note is all very well, but uh, file notes are often dictated and they're often not very good. And um, whereas if you actually 
advise in writing in a letter, which may seem old fashioned, but nevertheless, uh, it can be sent by email uh, <clears throat> and cover what your advice was. And there can be no argument over what's there in writing. Uh, so that's the advice. That's what the, uh, let's say, the Supreme Court has held is the correct way to deal with it. Uh, and solicitors just need to take extra care in relation to that. Um, guarantees, particularly, uh, I would see people um, don't feel any obligation to honour their responsibility on foot of guarantees because they don't see that they should be paying uh, on foot of a guarantee. But there you go. Now, there's a practice note has been published by the Law Society in relation to it uh, and is under remote witnessing. Uh, now, there was a bit of a glitch and there was it. I was the principal author of that practice note and <laughs> I didn't deal with uh, the question of the attestation clause and uh, a, a, a solicitor called Leo Mangan wrote in and saying, you know, why did we not deal with that? And uh, which is a very fair point. So there's an additional paragraph on it now, which uh, <coughs> deals with the attestation, which is a, in simpler terms, is that uh, you should, uh, it should reflect what happened. So if a deed is signed in the presence of, it should say that. If it was acknowledged in the presence of, it should say that. So it's straightforward. Um, and I don't think there's any um, <clears throat> confusion over it. But the, that extra paragraph <clears throat> wasn't in the practice note until quite recently. So you might have the old version if you're if you did see it and look at it on online so that's a sort of flyby of the whole area i mean digital signatures i'm not really dealing with because uh, until they come live i mean the the, the people who are using them <coughs> for commercial transactions don't need any guidance <clears throat> and won't be looking at this information session. Um, and so when they could become an issue, I believe that the witnessing of the application of the digital signature will be uh, the most important thing of all. And <clears throat> if that's also digital, which it probably will be, then the procedures will need to be it's hard to say waterproof, but that's what solicitors dealing with property want. Uh, how they're going to be waterproof, I don't know yet. Uh, so uh, for the future. So uh, have I gone too fast? I have. It's only well, don't fast. worry, worry. We, if anyone wants to ask a question, we'll we'll, we'll take it on the chat. Uh, I did have a secondary question that is not necessarily directly related to this, but is in relation to the vacant housing tax coming into force on the 1st of November. And is this going to be our new NPPR nightmare with retrospectively chasing documents? Uh, has the conveyancing committee uh, a view on this? And you can pass, because I'm kind of hitting you with that one uh, left field. Sorry. Well, well, no. I, well, you see, I think there's, it's actually so loose that I don't think it's the NPPR uh, the, the worst thing about the NPPR was uh, the actual penalty involved in it is her, was horrendous. So that for, and people abroad who own property here didn't know about it. And then when they went to sell, suddenly found that to be seven grand for a 200 euro uh, a year tax that they didn't know about. Um, the the vacant property tax, the, this was in simple terms, if you live in the property for uh, a month, uh, it doesn't apply. Uh, and there's so many exceptions, I think it's not really, uh, it, it isn't going to be 
a serious problem for solicitors. Now, there are obligations on uh, owners to, who, to record or to keep records of when uh, they're living in a vacant or in, a, a, let's say, a holiday home, to, which would be a typical example. Uh, and <clears throat> that, uh, but I could see down the line if the revenues got active on this and asked people to prove it and started looking for ESB bills and that, um, uh, it could become a nuisance. And if it's a nuisance for clients, it becomes a nuisance for us. Well, for the rest of you, actually, it just won't be a nuisance for me. <laughs> And, and Rory, are there any other matters, in the absence of anybody asking a question, uh, are there any other matters in the convincing committee that you, you think that people should, should attention should be brought to that are kind of being highlighted at the moment, just for general practitioners? Well, I suppose, um, I, let's say, a, a source of aggravation for people selling apartments are demands of a uh, uh, owners management companies and their property agents <clears throat> and that's something that we've been trying to uh, agree a procedure with the Society of Chartered Surveyors uh, to try and have something reasonable but the de unreasonable demands for undertakings to provide the purchasers um, <clears throat> uh, de contact details uh, being addressed to a vendor or solicitor are just ridiculous uh, uh, it's it if uh, if a vendor or solicitor uh, is selling a property for a client and it turns out there's arrears of service charge uh, the first thing you should do is ask the <coughs> vendor to pay the service charge and <coughs> if they can't and if they authorize you and give you a figure that you're to pay, <coughs> it is reasonable uh, to give an undertaking to the uh, a, a managing agent to actually pay it uh, on the completion of the sale, assuming it does complete. Uh, but the demands for undertakings for, let's say there was one recently where they wanted the vendor solicitor to undertake to return the parking fobs and uh, let's say that's a source of aggravation which we're well I mean the parking fobs is just another ridiculous request uh, but it's not unreasonable to want them back now managing agents tell tell us that uh, sometimes they first thing time to find out there's been a sale is when somebody turns up at an AGM, which I th seemed pretty extraordinary, but <laughs> I have no reason to doubt that that has happened. So, no question. I know there were there was some other uh, conveyancing notes uh, with regards to family law de declarations. Is that something you you you'd, you'd happily comment on? Or well, uh, uh, no, it's not an area within my area of expertise. I mean, there are family law, a set of family law declarations, which I think are being updated at yeah. the moment by people with the expertise. But uh, <clears throat> I'm not aware that the existing ones are causing any problem. So I need somebody oh. to, to help us by telling us what the problems are. And what about the Dickens <laughs> in loan offers that are, 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 there's another note on that also. Yes. Well, I haven't really, uh, because I'm out of practice, I yeah. don't like most people to just concentrate on things that actually are, are relevant <clears throat> and which that isn't relevant to me. So I can't really help anyone with that. And then the one on LPT transfers? LPT? Yes, the local property tax transfers. You well, with the that? LPT is a scourge for the profession, which... Uh, it's ridiculous, but uh, I thought that it had settled down pretty well. <clears throat> and what I've been hearing, uh, I'm not hearing about people tearing their hair out, which they were. I mean, I've told 
that they um, that the uh, they won't take payment by card anymore. So if a solicitor ends up having to pay LPT, I don't know <laughs> what way they require it to be paid. But <clears throat> I've recently been told that they won't take payment by card. Okay, which is a change, I think. Uh, there's a query there from, uh, well, it's actually just jumped away from me there. Uh, and that's from, uh, we have been asked by lenders to confirm everything from discrepancies in addresses on BER certs, variations on the borrower's name, car parking spaces, etc. So that's just sounds like extra bureaucracy. Um, uh, yes. <clears throat> well, that's for certainly sure. Um, uh, and then there's a query there where were parents gifting money for house purchase and deed of confirmation required one parent abroad and cannot travel for health reasons is re remote with witnessing okay in this situation well a deed of confirmation <coughs> uh, is uh, a, a deed and strictly speaking I, it's governed by the 2009 act uh, i mean the it, it something like that that's uh, relatively harmless. I, I think a lot of solicitors would be tempted to just uh, <clears throat> witness it. And uh, I mean, it's it's hard to see how that could come home to bite the solicitor. But um, technically, you know, it's either a deed. <clears throat> In this case, if they've gifted money to a child, usually to buy a house, they know <clears throat> they have to give the, uh, uh, let's say, that the lender has to get first uh, dibs on the property and therefore the deed of confirmation is just to formally deal with that. So there are a lot of the lenders who actually will take a confirmation that it's a gift and therefore that they don't acquire any actually interest in the property. They know they're not getting any interest in the property. So um, that's really all I could say about that. Yeah. And if anyone would like to ask a question, we have another uh, a couple of minutes. Uh, there's uh, oh, there's another question there. Sorry, just for coming in. Uh, oh, well, one parent in Ireland, one parent abroad, <coughs> bank one confirmation is a substantial gift and parents taking a right of residence. I'm well, not sure you answered. You might have answered that already. Well, I think I did the last one is that technically it's a, a deed and therefore it has to be witnessed in accordance with the 2009 Act. Okay. Uh, if anybody else has a, a question, we, we'll take it. But if not, I'll just give you a summary of... Um, oh, well, my screen is not now moving. Uh, these are the future sessions that are coming up. So next week, we've got cybersecurity, what support for practitioners with Tanya Muller. Uh, and the 18th of October, where are my clients' title deeds? How best to advise your clients, Suzanne Bacon. And then on the 1st of November and the 8th of November, we have two sessions on applying for PII. And then on the 15th of November, we have a talk with Martin Muller on uh, protecting the client account. I know um, that a lot of these, uh, the, 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 the practice support notes that I was referencing are available on the website. Um, so unless anyone has a final question or Rory, you want to give a final sum up, uh, I think we're, we're um, well, there's a question for you. Do you see remote witnessing of a deed being as being fatal? Mortgage deed, for example, does it affect validity? Uh, I don't think so. If the person signs, they sign. Uh, <coughs> if, the, if the solicitor didn't uh, actually genuinely witness it in accordance with the, the statute, <coughs> then that's uh, a side issue. Um, I mean, the, the, the risk is that uh, if it wasn't witnessed properly that and the person denies that they signed it, it, it becomes problematic. Okay. Well, unless, Rory, you see any other future developments coming down the track that, that you need to make people aware of, I think we'll... Uh or somebody would like to ask a final question, but uh, well, thank you for your time today and giving us such a, a unique insight into, in, into well, this I issue. Ju just to say that in relation to remote witnessing, you now have <clears throat> the distilled version of what I've said on the website for you to see, uh, including the business about attestation. 
yeah and we put a link uh, in the side chat there for you if you need a link to it and that that has been uh, uh, updated um sorry if this was uh, answered earlier i arrived late if a document refers to being signed in the presence of a solicitor can can that presence be by video call e.g a government or cro form well i mean the 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 point about that it depends on what the document is uh, it, the for a contract, it's absolutely no problem. Uh, if <coughs> it's a doc, a deed, then it depends. <coughs> uh, you, the two thousand and act, two thousand and nine act applies, <coughs> and <coughs> so, um, and it's certainly whatever about, uh, let's say a, a deed. Um, mortgages, uh, uh, um, let's say, and guarantees, it's definitely not a good idea. And you need to look at uh, the practice note, which sets it all out. Okay, so uh, there's a there's another question. They're coming in a little bit later. Um, I'm thinking of the forms that CRO and Central Register of Beneficial Ownership require from foreign directors and shareholders. Were, there, were the forms that he was referring to? I don't know whether that changes your your interpretation. Well, I haven't. It, it depends on what those forms. If it's the witnessing of the signatures, I mean, the problem about remote witnessing that people have to bear in mind is <clears throat> you need to actually know the person. If it's a new client and you actually don't know them, uh, uh, then uh, it's, uh, um, it's a dangerous pra practice. If it's somebody you know well, then, uh, and it's a document that doesn't require to be done in the presence of, then it's fine. And I think the second, Query Nicola Dowling has answered Pepe Santori's, Santoro's question, uh, which I, I'm not familiar with those forms and I don't know whether there are declarations or not. But the point being that if a declaration, if they are declarations, I don't think they can be sworn remotely, regardless of what, exactly. what they're yeah, Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's just a comment there. Would it help if you recorded the session? Of remote witnessing, would that change anything? Uh, well, I think that if it's if you were dealing with somebody who would actually renege <clears throat> on it, uh, that what they're signing, well, then you shouldn't be dealing with <laughs> witnessing anything remotely. I mean, if you don't trust them, uh, it probably would not be a bad idea. I wouldn't certainly think if, if you are doing a document that can be uh, uh, witnessed remotely or acknowledged remotely, <clears throat> then I think it might be a good idea to keep it and just keep that as a little video clip. Um, and it, it, it would be a sensible thing to do. But if it's an important document, then if you feel the need to record it, it means probably not a good idea. Yeah. Listen, I was just a quick shout out to Deborah Leonard, who is secretary to the conveyancing committee. And if you have any particular queries in the conveyancing area, uh, you should kind of refer them to her and she's more than happy to help. Uh, you can use my email to, to if you need to get her email. But uh, and I'd finally like to thank Rory for uh, taking the time today to, to join us. And thank you all. And hopefully you'll join us in our future sessions. So uh, any final words, uh, Rory? No, no, just... Uh... Thank you. That's it. Yep. All right, guys. Uh, thanks for thanks for coming along today. Uh, Slal, I was Gar Margot. Hopefully, we'll see you next week. Uh, Tony Muller on cybersecurity.